so I so uh, so welcome uh, uh, good morning welcome uh, welcome to Rachel uh, Lowen she's the new Stellar Group Leader at uh, the Valencia Security Center she's also an ICRA research professor she has um, still uh, the links with the London uh, as you can see in the slides the London School of Engineering. Uh, and tropical medicine, the center of climate change and planetary health, that is a, a very interesting. Uh, she will tell us a little bit more about that. And, uh, and uh, we are looking uh, really forward because um, we have been uh, uh, talking uh, in the last uh, four years that we have been at the BSC about doing something between the life science and the earth department. But that was always difficult because they, you know, difficult to find a common a common topic, and uh, and now I think this uh, open a, a new possibility because as we I guess we will see in a few minutes, uh, what what she has been doing and publishing uh, is super interesting, but it's very close to some of the things we are interested in terms of diseases, disease spread, relationship between diseases and populations. Uh, so I think that will be we are really, we are really looking forward because it's, uh, I think it's going to be a, a great opportunity and we really uh, look forward to, to see if we can really engage in, in collaborations uh, with, uh, with, 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 uh, with you and your group and obviously with, uh, with, uh, with the departments. I think that's uh, is the prospect for the future. And, 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 for the future. So without uh, more introduction, because uh, we don't want to take uh, time out of your talk, we, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alfonso. It's a pleasure to be here uh, speaking in this seminar series. Um, uh, so as Alfonso mentioned, I've just joined the Barcelona Supercomputing Center um, to lead a group on climate um, and global health resilience. And it, I'm really excited about the prospect of forming links between the earth science and the life science department at the BSc. Um, I was previously at um, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine leading the planetary health and infectious disease group. And I continue to serve on the management committee of the climate change and planetary health center there. So today I'm going to talk a bit about uh, strengthening global health resilience to climate change thinking about how climate change is impacting our health, um, some of the evidence gaps um, we have to understand the problem um, and, and address the problem. And then I'm going to talk through uh, some of the work that we've been developing uh, with partners across the globe to develop um, early warning systems and decision support systems to try and build resilience, particularly to uh, climate sensitive infectious diseases. been mediated through uh, many different pathways as climate change is causing rising temperatures, uh, rising sea level rise, increase, increasing extreme weather events. Um, this is under, interacting with the underlying uh, socioeconomic um, and environmental conditions. And through a variety of exposure pathways, uh, we're seeing increases in morbidity and mortality related to a whole range of health, health outcomes, including um, heat related mortality, um, injuries um, and mental health effects of extreme events, a whole range of foodborne, waterborne and vector-borne diseases, um, and also um, impacts on mental health from displacement and, and conflicts. And these uh, impacts are um, projected to um, change geographically um, and increase in burden. And it's um, in important that we need to develop very strong um, climate action to be able to uh, mitigate these uh, negative impacts. So uh, in uh, 2020, um, we put together a, um, a series of analyses for the British Medical Journal. Um, on climate change and communicable diseases. Um, and in, in this piece of work, uh, we proposed a series of um, interventions or strategies um, that should be prioritized to try and um, in, increase, uh, strengthen the global response um, 
to the impact of climate change on infectious disease threats. Uh, so our recommendations um, included um, recognizing and framing the problem with a transdisciplinary lens, uh, recognizing um, that human health um, is also depends on um, the health of um, planets uh, of um, the planet, um, on animals, and addressing this from a uh, One Health uh, framework um, to really be able to uh, build integrated systems. Uh, we also uh, recognize the importance of uh, leading by example and addressing the um, health sector emissions and how important it is to mitigate um, the emissions from the health sector itself. Uh, there's also a real lack of funding in the area of climate and health. There have been some positive uh, movements lately uh, from agencies such as uh, the Wellcome Trust, but there really needs to be a, a, a lot more investment in in being able to build, um, adapt to and build uh, resilience to the impacts of climate change on our health. Um, and this can be done through increased um, surveillance, education, um, uh, interventions to, to help displaced um, populations and also novel diagnostics. We also need to build um, capacity and data management, um, integrated surveillance and leadership. We need to be able to, training, uh, to train the next generation um, of technical experts to be able to um, build that bridge and link the climate sector to the health sector. Um, we also need to increase our uh, capacity to incorporate earth observations into um, early warning systems um, uh, to be able to predict in advance when and where um, outbreaks might happen and to improve uh, decision support analytics and bearing in mind that this capacity building needs to be done, uh, taking into consideration um, inclusion and diversity. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this uh, well used uh, graphic, uh, which shows us the change in um, annual temperatures across the globe from 1950 until present day. And we can see this very intensive um, warming over the last um, 40 to 30 decades. And this has coincided with the rapid expansion of diseases like dengue fever. In the 1970s, there were nine countries reporting um, outbreaks of the disease, and that has increased to over 120 countries. And it's estimated by the World Health Organization that around half the world's population is now at risk of mosquito-borne diseases. So um, last year, we published um, a modeling study where we were using climate change projections and socioeconomic um, scenarios to estimate the changing risk of uh, two of the most important vector-borne diseases, um, malaria and dengue. And uh, we looked at this change in risk according to different um, urban and altitudinal gradients. And we found that if um, emissions are to continue um, as they are in a business as usual scenario, uh, with increases of up to 3.7 degrees C by the end of the century, then we could see an additional 4.7 billion people at risk of these uh, mosquito-borne diseases. Whereas if concerted action were to be taken to limit uh, warming below one degree, that increase would be limited to around half uh, and be an increase of uh, 2.4 billion people. So of course, it's not just climate change that influences um, the risk of outbreaks of um, infectious diseases like dengue. Uh, it's very much uh, associated uh, with factors such as unplanned urbanization and inadequate infrastructure. This image here shows uh, one of the largest favelas in the city of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Um, we can see here lots of blue patches and these are um, temporary water storage containers and during um, extreme events and water storages, uh, the population are reliant on, on these uh, water storage containers and they also serve as um, breeding sites for the um, Aedes aegypti um, mosquito. Um, and the combination of these extreme uh, climatic events combined with densely populated and um, poorly serviced areas uh, provides the sort of perfect storm for outbreaks of these infectious diseases. Um, but due to international travel um, and trade, which is allowing uh, people and the vectors to spread across the globe, we're also seeing uh, dengue being imported into new areas. We've seen um, 
several outbreaks in Europe over the last decade. Uh, in, uh, we've seen localized outbreaks in, in France, Croatia, Spain. We had a large outbreak in the Portuguese island of Madeira. So this combination of um, global heating and an increase in extreme climatic events combined with globalization is really um, putting uh, the whole globe at risk of the outbreaks of these diseases. So we've been trying to find ways to make use of all the global observations that are available to us um, to monitor the earth and see how we can uh, use this inform information and translate it into something that could be useful for local uh, decision makers. So we try and combine um, grid gridded um, earth observations and climate products with uh, surveillance data that's collected by um, health centers um, and hospitals um, and aggregated by um, health centers um, and, and to develop models to really understand these associations and relationships between um, changes in, in the climate and the risk of um, vector-borne diseases. And uh, we really put a focus on our work, the co-creation of these decision support systems uh, with our stakeholders and the people on the ground who may actually use these. Um, and we're trying to develop our models in such a way that they could be uh, eventually turned into sustainable um, decision support systems and operational climate services. So we've recently um, developed, thanks to a UK space agency funded project, a early warning system for dengue in Vietnam. Um, in this work, we've been uh, working with the Ministry of Health um, in Vietnam, uh, UNDP and the World Health Organization. And we have developed a system based on um, stakeholder consultation where uh, our system relies on a live stream of um, dengue case data that's provided every month. And we couple um, a prediction model that we've developed with a seasonal climate forecasts from the Met Office. And each month we provide uh, risk maps um, and time series to show uh, the probability of exceeding um, user-defined epidemic thresholds. Um, this work was published uh, last year in PLOS Medicine, uh, led by Felipe Colón González. Uh, this is a, a snapshot from the system we've developed. Um, the, it's, it's called uh, DEMOS, and in this system, uh, users are able to access a risk map to see the probability of a threshold in their particular threshold, uh, sorry, in their particular province, and to track um, the evolution of the uh, the dengue situation from one to six months in advance based on the seasonal climate information. Uh, we've also been working on um, a project in the Caribbean with the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology and the Caribbean uh, Public Health Agency to try and understand how extreme hydrometeorological events are impacting or changing um, uh, the dengue epidemiology. Uh, we've been particularly developing some work in uh, Barbados, where it was um, observed that the dengue outbreaks were tending to occur following drought events. And Barbados is one of the most, uh, it's in the top 10, water, uh, top 20 water scarce countries um, in the world. And a recommendation had been made uh, to store water under um, buildings to try and mitigate the impacts of drought, but this was leading to the unintended consequence of these additional mosquito breeding sites. So this is a collection of work that we've put together on um, modeling uh, the impact of these uh, hydrometeorolo hydrometeorological events on dengue, and also the uh, stakeholder engagement work we've been conducting, interviewing um, from regional to local uh, stakeholders, and uh, some work we've been doing on uh, co-learning and uh, how we've been able to learn from the uh, decision makers working on the ground and, and bringing that together with our model framework to try and design something that can be implemented in practice. So we found that uh, by combining or allowing developing a model uh, to account for both uh, long-term and short-term climate extremes, we found that um, a drought event followed uh, several months later by extremely wet conditions provided the optimum conditions for dengue outbreaks. Um, 
And we also found that if this is combined by uh, warming uh, two months in advance, then we have the um, optimum environmental conditions for an outbreak. So this has allowed us um, to try and develop a system where we can model um, throughout the year um, whether we're observing um, particularly, for example, hot and dry conditions, and then using a forecast to see if that will be followed by an extremely wet condition, and whether we would then issue an alert of a high risk of a dengue outbreak. Whereas if we are to have cool and dry conditions and those dry conditions continue, then our model would then predict a low risk um, of an outbreak. And uh, this finding is, has been incorporated into the um, Caribbean Health Climatic Bulletin, which is issued on a quarterly basis um, by the Pan American Health Organization, um, CARFA and CIMH. Um, and in 2020, there was um, a drought event uh, that was um, then followed by a seasonal forecast for extreme uh, for extremely wet conditions. So a warning went out to the countries in the Eastern Caribbean to be monitoring the situation and being particularly aware of uh, ensuring water storage containers were, were, clear of, um, were cleared as potential breeding sites. And through a, um, a collaboration with the Red Cross Climate Center, we developed a, um, a training um, activity with our partners um, to uh, to develop this impact-based forecasting uh, methodology for predicting arboviral disease risk in uh, small island developing states. Um, and this is a prototype that was put together by the um, meteorological services in Barbados. So this is based on a framework they've developed for other um, climate sensitive outcomes such as dust haze. And uh, this is, they use this um, a matrix that's been designed uh, by um, the Met Office and the World Meteorological Organization, where do, we can combine the, the, the prediction of the, the impact of the event with the confidence of that happening, and then issuing uh, warnings to do with uh, whether we should take action, be prepared, be aware, or no action needed. So we're currently in the process of working to see how we can translate our probabilistic dengue forecasts into this kind of framework. Um, so that each month uh, the Ministry of Health can be prepared um, to take action based on the seasonal climate forecast. So we've also been working uh, with partners in Ecuador um, using uh, forecasts of El Nino to try and understand uh, the, um, the impact of mosquito-borne diseases. Um, so we've developed a a series of work where we identified uh, sensitivity of dengue outbreaks to El Nino events. And then we incorporated um, forecasts of El Nino itself and also um, the local climatic conditions, both rainfall and uh, temperature, um, following one of the largest El Nino events on record in 2016. Um, and also seeing how our system then uh, responded to uh, subsequent uh, El Nino events. So this map here just shows us the correlation between the sea surface temperatures in the Pacific um, and uh, the rainfall across the globe. And we can see a, a strong positive correlation uh, with rainfall and, and also temperature in um, the coastal area of Ecuador and Peru. And also we can see um, in the north uh, of Ecuador there, these particular hotspots um, to El Nino events. Um, this is uh, an example of the kind of situation the local population were dealing with in the um, coastal city of Machala following um, extreme flooding that occurred with this um, large El Nino event in 2015-16. Um, and this here shows us the um, precipitation and temperature seasonal climate forecast um, that was issued um, in January of 2016. And we can see the dashed black uh, line here shows us the actual observed um, precipitation. In this particular case, thanks to the El Nino event, the seasonal climate forecast did a particularly good job at detecting this increase um, in uh, rainfall in February 2016, which coincided with the extreme flooding. Um, and then this uh, forecast was incorporated into our um, dengue risk prediction model. And we can see that um, 
If we'd have been using uh, the endemic channel, which is uh, the average dengue cases over the previous five years, which is typically used by public health uh, services uh, to understand um, whether you may be getting uh, an out of season um, uh, dengue situation, then the peak of the season would have been expected in June of 2016. But thanks to our model, uh, it was able to predict an earlier peak in, in March um, 2016. So this was a demonstration of how if we incorporate uh, forecasts of um, El Nino or local climate conditions into our dengue model, then we may have a chance of predicting out of season peaks or changes in the magnitude of the season. So we've been developing uh, for several years now um, this work with our partners in, in Brazil. Uh, this is where my PhD research started um, working on a project using seasonal climate forecasts to try and um, improve uh, predictions for the health sector, agriculture and, and hydrology. And uh, we have developed a model that we then um, used to try and predict uh, the dengue situation ahead of the 2014 World Cup. So this was our, our first um, opportunity to try and put into practice a prediction model. So uh, it was quite a, a challenging experience to incorporate seasonal climate forecasts um, into our model, along with the epidemiological situation um, at the time of forecast and to put out a forecast um, ahead of time um, and this was published um, in the Lancet Infectious Diseases ahead of the World Cup and reported in, in several um, media outlets and travel advisories. And after the event, we were then able to verify um, our forecast with the observed data and assess how well our model actually did at predicting um, the, the correct category. And, and we could stratify this by um, the risk, whether it was high risk, medium or low. Um, so there were instances when our model did a good job at predicting um, high risk, um, particularly in the northeast um, of Brazil, and areas where the model um, didn't do quite as well, perhaps because it was missing some of the um, local uh, peculiarities related with changes in, in practices uh, related to dealing with the, the World Cup. But um, overall, our model um, did considerably better than current practice, which is, is using seasonal averages. And so we've been looking to extend our, our, the modeling framework that we built initially in, in Brazil. So bringing in what we learned from um, our models in Barbados, where we found this uh, link between uh, drought and extreme rainfall conditions. And it was very interesting that when we uh, expanded this, uh, this model framework to, the, to a spatial case um, across the um, uh, geographically diverse landscape of Brazil, we found the same pattern held that um, uh, if a drought uh, four months ahead of, uh, and combined with extreme rainfall, um, say one month ahead, provided uh, the ideal uh, situation for dengue outbreaks. And this pattern was particularly exacerbated in urban areas. And uh, we also used data on reported water shortages and, and found a very similar situation. So, we believe that the scope for tailoring uh, these forecasts and monitoring systems, depending on the, the landscape. So for example, in, in urban settings, it's particularly important to be monitoring um, extreme uh, drought conditions. Um, uh, whereas in the rural uh, settings, particularly in the Amazon, uh, the outbreaks were more sensitive to the, um, uh, the short-term extremely wet conditions. So this is a, a framework that we're currently developing. And uh, this work, uh, this was a, a, a blog that was published uh, by the Anticipation Hub of, of the Red Cross um, last year. And this is an example of some work that's been developed by Sophie Lee, a PhD student in my group. Um, looking at the reasons behind the expansion of dengue fever in Brazil over the um, since the, the turn of the century. Um, so we can see on the left hand side, um, this is looking at um, places that have experienced um, an outbreak um, compared to uh, the second half. Um, um, so to compare to uh, so the first 10 years compared to the last 10 years. And we can see that dengue is really expanding into the Amazon and also spreading further south. Um, 
So we just recently published a paper in PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases looking at the reasons behind this. And we find that um, uh, the number of months with temperatures suitable for uh, transmission um, is explaining this expansion, particularly into the south. Um, we also uh, looked at uh, incorporating um, a hierarchical urban network into the model. So looking at um, areas which are particularly connected to the um, urban hubs um, and seeing how this connectivity plays a role. And we find that medium sized cities, um, uh, the increase in connectivity with them is, is also uh, driving particularly this expansion into the Amazon. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to uh, switch and talk a little bit about uh, the Lancet Countdown collaboration. So the Lancet Countdown is a, um, a global collaboration tracking progress on health and climate change. Um, it's been publishing reports uh, looking at indicators and a whole variety of um, uh, climate sensitive outcomes in, in different areas. So this, uh, we track, um, impacts on health in terms of vulnerability exposure and impacts in terms of adaptation mitigation and co-benefits um, finance and economics and social and political engagement um, so over the last five years this collaboration has grown and expanded we're now publishing uh, 41 indicators uh, this is an example of um, a malaria indicator which i was leading on um, so here we can see um, how uh, the suitability, sorry, for malaria transmission has changed since 1950 to uh, 2020 um, in uh, highland areas. And we stratify this by the uh, Human Development Index. So we can see in, particularly in, in Africa and the African highlands where there's a low Human Development Index, we can see a really marked increase in the uh, climate suitability for malaria in, the, in the, the length of the transmission season. And in the map, we can see um, the areas in red showing a, a positive change in the length of the transmission season. So these are kind of indicators that can help um, sort of target and prioritize um, areas for um, mitigation and adaptation. And in September 2021, we launched the um, Lancet Countdown in Europe which I am uh, leading from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And in this, um, in this uh, regional effort, we, we hope to really take advantage of the wealth of data that is available in Europe and uh, put a lens on the European uh, region and, and look at tracking uh, these different outcomes. We're currently developing um, additional climate sensitive disease indicators, for example, in West Nile virus, um, in tick-borne diseases. Um, we published our framework report in the Lancet Public Health, and we're working now um, alongside the European Environment Agency to develop policy relevant indicators that are going to be incorporated into the European Climate and Health Observatory. Um, so this is a really exciting space for strengthening um, climate resilience in Europe. And uh, we've developed a consortium um, where we're developing a, a framework which combines the One Health concept of recognizing um, the dependency of human, animal and environmental health with the uh, risk framework developed by the IPCC uh, of tracking uh, risks in terms of hazard exposure and vulnerability. So this is um, a, an area that we're developing, bringing together lots of different partners in Europe to really uh, see how we can track and build resilience to um, the health impacts of climate change in Europe. And we're also um, at the BSC about to start a brand new project with partners in Latin America on harmonizing multi-scale spatiotemporal data for health in climate change hotspots. And we're really here focusing on developing um, digital infrastructure and toolkits which are specific to settings including cities, um, the Amazon rainforest, small island developing states and um, highlands, particularly in the Andes. And we're looking to be able to harmonize and integrate um, data from um, satellites and gridded products, as well as uh, locally collected data from uh, drones and weather stations, and to be able to combine this with the uh, disease surveillance data and socioeconomic information to really provide the evidence that's needed to build uh, robust 
uh, statistical and machine learning approaches to, to strengthen to see, um, local decision support systems. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, but I know that um, Alfonso and your, your group are developing lots of work on um, COVID-19. Um, so I just thought I would very briefly uh, mention the work that we've um, developed at um, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, during uh, the start of the pandemic, we formed a collaboration between the Centre for Mathematical Modelling of Infectious Diseases and the multi-city, multi-country um, collaboration. So we were able to um, combine the data collected by this, uh, the multi-city, uh, multi-country collaboration. Um, we collected over um, 3 million um, COVID-19 cases across 500 cities. Um, we then combined this with um, meteorological indicators for each of these cities um, to try and understand how the um, effective reproduction number in these cities uh, may have been impacted by these uh, meteorological conditions early um, in the pandemic. So this is just an example of uh, the advantage of looking at this from um, finer scale city level. At the beginning of the pandemic, there were lots of studies that came out correlating uh, national level cases with you know, national level temperature, which really does not make sense, particularly for somewhere like Brazil. So we can see here, if we look, look at this inset, we can see the you know, the mean temperature for the whole of Brazil um, compared to, you know, the variation in temperature and the location of the cities for where we were able to collect the COVID-19 um, data. This here is showing uh, the change in the government response um, index, uh, which is, was published um, to track uh, the, the level of response uh, by governments, including travel restrictions, uh, mask mandates, school closures, uh, workplace closures, et cetera. And you can see um, how this varied um, by place. And so what we did was we, we restricted our, um, our data set um, to places where at least um, 10 cases had been reported. So assuming that meant that local uh, transmission had already been established rather than um, imported cases. And before the government uh, response index had reached a threshold of 70. So we're really trying to, if we could, find this period of um, unmitigated transmission, although that really was not possible because many people were uh, already taking their own measures to protect themselves and change their behavior. Um, so we found that um, sort of very modest impact of uh, mean temperature and absolute humidity on this early transmission, but even when we uh, restricted uh, the data to the sort of early period, we found that even in, in this case, the Oxford government index um, had a much greater impact and uh, explained six times more of, of the variation than the, the local meteorological conditions. And this very much aligned uh, with the findings from the first um, World Meteorological Organization COVID-19 task team. So last year we published a report um, concluding um, that it was very much the uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions and human behavior and underlying socioeconomic vulnerabilities that were driving um, the, um, the epidemic in, in each location, uh, rather meteorological conditions. Although, um, you know, as, as COVID um, evolves and develops, uh, there is scope for it becoming um, uh, a seasonal disease. However, um, while we're still experiencing uh, various variants of concern and uh, differing levels of vaccination coverage, it's very difficult to be able to um, detect a, any kind of climate signal in this. However, there is scope for using climate services to support um, the COVID response, uh, particularly looking at these compound hazards and, and COVID-19 um, in terms of wildfires and air quality, in terms of providing adequate um, uh, conditions in shelters following um, uh, extreme events like hurricanes, and also ensuring proper um, hand hygiene in uh, droughts and, and other um, environmentally uh, strained areas in terms of hand hygiene. So I think that's everything I have uh, to present for now. Um, I'd be very uh, welcome your questions and thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you for sharing. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's a lot of things. <laughs> Very interesting. So we have uh, time for questions. Uh, so I have some, but I'll see if um, we get some more participation. Enrique, good social. to see you, please. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Rachel, uh, very interesting and very well presented um, piece of, of all this work that you have been uh, carrying out. Uh, it looks to me that, that uh, everything you do actually can be directly transferred or has an impact in, in policy makers, it should have, you know? especially in health systems. And my question to you is, how do, how do you uh, what is your impression of their reaction to your work when you present to them your results? I mean, how do they uh, accept them? Uh, how do they react? And do they do they do something with your data? But not with your data, with your results, with your predictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've had. Um... I think one of our, our best experience of, of working really very closely uh, with the stakeholders is in the Caribbean, because it's been a really uh, sort of demand driven piece of research. It's very, you know, through this collaboration that's already been developed um, with the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology and the public health services, there really is that um, desire to, to develop some kind of systems that can help. So we, we've got to the stage where everything we developed was um, in, in collaboration, it really was a sort of a, a co-creation co uh, joint effort. Um, so we tried to, uh, using the available data and, and the forecast, develop something that could in theory be used. And we're trying to actually make something that can be used and sustained. But the, the challenge we have is having that local capacity to make it happen. You know, everything we've done has been funded by little pockets of, you know, where we can, we have a little consultancy here or there. We don't really have anything very sustainable to keep this going. Um, but we're trying now um, working with the, we've recognized that the, the meteorological services in Barbados, they do have the technical capacity to add an additional climate service for health alongside all their other climate services. Um, so we're trying to find a framework that can be, not too demanding. We've also found a challenge that, for example, during the pandemic, it would have been impossible to supply this live stream of, you know, real-time dengue cases. If you have a system where you, you can constantly update your predictions uh, with the current situation, then you're going to have a much better forecast. But by doing that, you, you weaken your, your model because then you're relying on, you know, that, that flow of information, which can't, isn't always possible in certain uh, resource strain settings. So we're trying to develop the most simple model we can. Now we've, we've recognized that these, using our distributed lag models, um, that if you take account of the whole distribution, you can, so, but we're trying to translate that into something which is much more simple. Um, so it can just use a few inputs of observed data followed by a seasonal forecast to get, then give a disease risk prediction. And so it has in a sort of qualitative way already been incorporated into the uh, climatic bulletins. And, and our next step is really to make it sustainable and, and be able to produce these quantitative monthly forecasts. Whereas in Vietnam, um, that's where we've had like really uh, good experience that that system is being used um, on a monthly basis. It's a closed system, which is just uh, only accessible by the, um, the local authorities and Ministry of Health themselves. And, and they have been uh, using it, the, the probabilistic forecast to help them decide where they may want to uh, ramp up their vector control measures, for example, or make sure the local teams are, are prepared. Um, but we need to take that a step further. At the moment, we have province level forecasts, but really um, our stakeholders would like to see that more detailed. So we're now currently working on uh, district level forecasts to try and get that more sort of spatial resolution. Thank you. Thank you. I find this a challenge itself um, very interesting uh, to, to follow up. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Rachel, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I really like it. My question is a little bit of a curiosity. How easy is to access all the data that you are using? And how standardized is that data? Do you need to do a lot of manipulations to put everything together or is everyone is following the standards? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so 
I, I wouldn't say it's very standardized. Um, so we are very lucky. I, I started uh, this kind of work in Brazil and Brazil actually have a really excellent um, passive surveillance system um, and they make all their data um, available. So, uh, so, you know, when I first started modeling this, I had like 10 years of data. Now we've got 20 years of data and uh, that has, that, that's pretty good quality um, surveillance data. And then uh, the challenge is trying to um, harmonize that with the um, environmental uh, data. So we also have, we tend to combine the health data with the um, socioeconomic factors, which tend to come from the census. So that's usually, that usually has the same uh, spatial resolution, same administrative uh, levels. Uh, sometimes you may have, um, you may have to uh, make everything align at the same administrative uh, division. And for the environmental data, um, you know, if ideally you would have access to uh, local meteorological stations in each one of your um, municipalities, um, but in reality we're having to, to rely on um, gridded satellite products, um, you know, and the many different ways that you can align that data with your health data, uh, either through sort of, you know, aggregating across those administrative units, population weighting, or using some sort of uh, downscaling. So I wouldn't say there's a particularly uh, standard way of doing it. Um, in other instances, if we're working, you know, in a small and developing state, then it's more just a uh, island-wide risk estimate. Um, so yeah, it very much depends on the, you know, we kind of start with what level do the health uh, the health decision makers want their forecasts at? You know how good is the quality of the um, the disease data? We tend to because we're using um, the seasonal forecasts um, and to avoid issues with very low numbers occasion. We often tend to look at this model the monthly um, changes, but there's also it's also possible to to look at this at, by epidemiological week or e even daily. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Rachel, thank you so much for this presentation. It was uh, uh, outstanding. I, I, I follow this wave of uh, asking you about challenges. So we, we talk about acceptance and um, uh, policy options, uh, data access and standards. And I would like to ask you about challenges from a more technological point of view. So what about uh, challenges uh, of artificial intelligence application to this, uh, this area. And, uh, and the HPC, the uh, high performance computing, uh, considering the environment in which uh, you are going to work. Sorry, could you just repeat the, the question? The question is about uh, what, what do you foresee as uh, technological challenges for uh, those projects in terms of artificial intelligence and the use of uh, HPC resources? Mm. Yeah, so uh, I, I mean, I think one of the, the biggest challenges in our areas, like really back to basis, is, is the data curation and, and having, you know, for example, I was speaking to um, uh, MSF and we're trying to develop some kind of early warning system for Honduras, but there's really just the, the epidemiological data is not strong enough to to develop some robust, um, you know, statistical learning type approaches and so, like, having a data driven approach. So that's a big uh, challenge. So, you know, do, do we go back and try and uh, recover and correct that data? Or do we help countries set up, you know, new uh, surveillance systems going forward to make sure that all the the, the data that's needed to inform, you know, AI and uh, are in place? Um, so there's there's lots of challenges there. Also, there's also some areas which are easier to address, like really making a good job at linking these disparate data sets from all these different resolutions and making sure that is done in the most robust manner. And that's what we're hoping to, to address through our, our Harmonize project. Um, and then did was your, was your second question related to the environmental impact of high performance computing or? Uh, yeah, as well, actually, well, it, I, I didn't ask directly, but okay. yes, that's also like a, a very... Yeah, that's, <laughs> definitely, <laughs> that's definitely uh, an issue that has to be addressed. Uh, yeah, I can't answer that one on my own. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That was my, my screen. Uh, Vicky. Oops. 
We cannot hear you, Vicky. No. Better now? No, it's better, yeah. Okay, I think my, my mic is not working as I, as I would like to. Um, so my question is, uh, and also following Davides, is possible to infer data from other countries? So if you don't have uh, accessible data for a location or an area or a country, is it possible to infer data from other countries or other data? I don't know. Have you tried that's, that? That's a really good question. So we're very sort of cautious, you know, emphasizing the importance of developing, you know, if you're working with these statistical model frameworks, really to develop it in, in, the, in the local setting to make sure you can pick up the local nuances and develop it with the local stakeholders, because we, we're very cautious about just extrapolating to other places, because you can find uh, even like different climate sensitivities, depending on like the underlying uh, landscape or socioeconomic situation. But in terms of, um, the, the indicator work we've been doing, we're seeing, you know, if we can come up with indicators um, that could be uh, sort of helping to track aspects of the risks, for example, the climate hazard uh, part of the risk or the vulnerability, and if we can track those things, uh, can that just help us, you know, expand, make these um, indicators at the global level or at the regional level? So even though it's more of a crude approach and, and perhaps there's less precision, it might be more suitable to annual tracking. That's kind of, you know, one of the approaches we're looking at trying to learn and um, verify and validate in places where we do have strong data to see if we can help understand sort of the, the um, larger scale risk. Okay, thank you. Martin. Thanks, uh, Rachel, for the very nice talk. I have a, I'm, I'm working on text mining and there are some like disease outbreaks and surveillance systems using local media or social media. Have you thought about um, exploiting maybe, and especially also for Dengue, like in India or in Southeast Asia, um, have you thought about integrating like either social media or um, or kind of other kind of information sources and correlate what kind of you know input or information these kind of disease surveillance or disease outbreak systems might um, provide maybe more like a um, let's say um, complementary view or maybe more like um, symptoms or diseases or some sort of more let's say complementary information to what you can already you know extract or if you experience with integrating this kind of information or correlating them yeah no that's that's a great idea but yeah that has actually been done uh, some of our colleagues in in brazil are, are working on that actually my colleague claudia codesso is on the line i don't know if you want to say anything claudia because uh, um i believe that monitoring tweets are uh, are also incorporated into the dengue info um info dengue system which is a real-time uh, monitoring early warning system for dengue in brazil and and as also as part of the um Lancet countdown, we're also tracking uh, the, those kind of indicators to understand, you know, how much uh, people are talking about climate change and health and, and, and the different aspects. So but I would be really interested in, in thinking about how we can incorporate that in, into the models we develop, we're developing for different countries. So, yeah, it'd be great to speak about that. Thank you. My, 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 I was going to ask, and I think it's related with many of these questions, is for the for the levels of granularity, because at the end of this, uh, uh, you know, you have uh, now predictions for regions, but obviously then you can stratify this by type of population, age, um, previous conditions, and you can imagine an infinite number of stratification levels by population, but at the same time by, by location. You know, temperature change a lot, for example, in a, in a, in a given region. You know, you know, the, the, the local environment, the housing, and you know all that. So what is your, your view on, on how far can you go in uh, granularity analysis, you know, analyzing different levels of granularity? Yeah, I mean, if it, if it's possible to have the data, then th th that's great. You know, so as, as the more targeted we can go, the better. Um, so we did some modeling work. Um, we tried to model um, 
the impact of climate on malaria in Malawi, and we, we could stratify by you know, under fives and over fives. And, and it's very important to look at these problems at, you know, with a gender lens as well, and being able to understand the, um, how, how that um, has an impact. So I think, yeah, the finer we can go, the better. Um, so it all, all just depends on the data that's available to us. I mean, we're able to, um, where we have infamous information on um, land cover, socioeconomic indicators, housing indicators, we, we do incorporate those, but sometimes at the spatial scales, sometimes we're limited at working at spatial scales where a lot of those signals are sort of uh, wiped out by the uh, by urbanization. Mm -hmm. So for example, before we've explored things to do with um, uh, access to pipe water, refuge collection, and, and that signal just gets swamped out by the urbanization because all, all in, the more urbanized an area, the better overall conditions it has. So yeah, there's definitely scope for, for getting sort of finer scale data to really understand and look a bit more closely at the underlying um, vulnerability. Will this be better in Europe? Will it be easier to access more granular information in Europe or not? I'm, 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 we are struggling with this problem of uh, data access, not for socioeconomical data, for example. It's very badly organized, so it's very difficult to get uh, socioeconomical data across different countries in Europe. I know you are facing the same problems. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so the, there are some, there is a lot more data for cert, certain things um, in, in Europe, but. There, there are challenges, yeah, with, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what's the best population data sets to use and socioeconomic. I mean, we tend to, like, uh, with it, with the EEA, they're particularly keen at looking at things, for example, at the NUTS2 level. Um, I mean, some of the data is available at the NUTS3 level, so these are just different um, res spatial resolutions across Europe. But no, I agree with you, it is um, a challenge, and I think it's something that... Um, that, that could be improved, uh, the availability of these um, sort of the underlying population socioeconomic data. One more question. We are always struggling with how do we have the data or not? And as I think we spend more time on this question of do we have the data or not than anything else. Um, for the diseases, for the trend, you know, um, your different disease cases. Do you have indications if this, uh, if, if they have, if, if there is a disease, disease relation? So if this, they have a previous disease, or, or what is the, what is the impact of previous uh, health conditions on the impact of the diseases? Or do you only get the information about the specific disease number of cases and that's it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so yeah, we tend to just. Uh, provided sort of counts of cases per month, you know, in a particular um, geographical area. Um, but, you know, we are, I, I'm started to work with, um, there's a, a project in Brazil and the SIDAC project where there's, they have the like cohort mo monitoring um, like millions of, of people across Brazil sort of looking at this cohort. And then I think there's a, an opportunity there to look at um, sort of comorbidities and the impact of other health impacts. So that's definitely something I, I'd like to explore in the future. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be really interesting if we have the data, you have the data. Well, too. Uh, other questions or more questions? So uh, if I may, no, just just to, to, to finish in a few minutes. So now that we are getting uh, now back to to Spain, no? uh, now that we're getting the a number of these tropical diseases, the, the use of the the, 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 the Nilo virus uh, in, in Andalusia. So the are you following that? And the prospects are as bad as they look like in terms of getting worse and worse uh, by the year. Sorry, could you could you repeat that? So we, are, we are getting now in a, a, a relevant number of cases of tropical diseases. The, the last mm -hmm. one this summer was the Nilo the, and the Nilo, the Nilo uh, virus yes. in Andalusia. And I wonder if you are, if you are following that and if it's uh, because it's really, really uh, very bad. I mean, it was not existing two years ago and not really a, a real problem. 
Are you following that? And it's looking as bad as it, as it looks like on the newspaper? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we work quite uh, closely with the uh, public health agency in, in Barcelona and, and sort of other uh, partners working on um, vector control and in the One Health area in Spain, and they're very closely tracking uh, and it is, it is a worry, it is a, is, is a threat. And, and that's the sort of thing that we, we hope to be able to understand better um, through our, our ID Alert project, where we're, we're combining um, this sort of One Health with the um, sort of monitoring of climate hazards and vulnerability. Um, so yes, that's definitely something that we're, we're keeping an eye out on. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. So if there are no more questions, no more questions, we will thank uh, Rachel very much for the for the nice talk and for all the examples and for answering all these questions of the, the methods and the data and the prospect. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have some time to talk, so maybe we can stay on this on this Zoom. Sure. Right yeah. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye.